Hello and welcome to Online Worship with Davidsonville United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are here worshiping online with us today. Whether you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, we ask that you let us know you're here. Either like this video or leave a comment below. That really gives us an idea of who is worshiping with us, who is engaging in our online spaces. One thing I'm also going to ask you to do, maybe for the first time, is to share this video. If you're watching on Facebook, you can hit the little share button and share with your friends. Or if you're watching on YouTube, you can forward the worship email to someone. We want to reach more and more people in our community and online with the message of Christ. Now more than ever, as we are in this sermon series of Out of the Darkness, it is important for us to share the light of Christ. And an easy way to do that is to share this worship video with your friends and family. So go ahead and right now share that video or forward the email before we dive into worship today. A few announcements for us. We want to be grounded in prayer and to connect to each other better this year. So to do that, we have two prayer options. One we've had all along since the pandemic started, our weekday morning Zoom prayer sessions. If you need the link to join that prayer group, they meet every weekday morning, Monday through Friday at 8.30 a.m. And it's a short time, 30 minutes online where they together dive into scripture and support each other with what's going on in their lives and they pray. They pray for you, they pray for me, they pray for each other. We also are starting up midweek prayers, where every Wednesday around lunchtime, give or take, one of our pastoral team will be sharing a prayer video on Facebook or YouTube. The video will have all the prayer requests from the week from our community, prayers that people send in on our website or prayers that people leave with the church office. We really want to unite together and connect together as a community. And one way we can do that is through prayer. So we wanna pray for you. We wanna pray for your family. We wanna pray for what's going on in the world. You can always comment on these videos, your prayer requests, but we also have that link on our website where you can leave your prayer requests for us to lift up. In that prayer Zoom meeting every weekday morning and in our Wednesday, prayer videos and in our Sunday online worship services. We just want to unite together and connect deeper through prayer. So with all of those announcements out of the way, let us center ourselves and worship today. I told you 
Good day. Today I'm in the church parlor standing beside the church library. We're going to be talking about the importance of stories that shape our lives and build our identity. And so I thought this forgotten space would be a great place to bring you the message. There's lots of books here, study guides, different versions of the Bible, stories that instruct, books that inspire, and even children's books. You're welcome to borrow any of them. You just have to make an appointment with the office and pick up a key. We're going to be studying the Gospel of Mark for several weeks, so it'll be a great time to come down and borrow a study guide or a version of the Bible that you don't yet own. Mark doesn't mess around. In just the first 13 verses we discover who Jesus is and what power and authority he has been given and um, what he is proclaiming which is the kingdom of God and we even are given hints of the threats to come. Mark's prelude <laughs> reminds me of a lectionary comic strip by Ang Angus Day. It's, it's sheep are the main characters. And the first sheep is reading the book of Mark. And he says, in the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the second sheep comments, well, Mark gets right to the point, doesn't he? Causing the first sheep to stop and kind of look over the Bible that he's holding with, a, with wonder. What are you doing? asks the second sheep. I was just checking to make sure that this wasn't the Reader's Digest condensed version, says the first. Mark's Gospel has that sense of emergency. The story moves along rapidly. Immediately after the opening line, we find John baptizing in the wilderness, baptizing for the repentance and forgiveness of sin. And he says, one is coming, someone more powerful than I, and he will baptize with the power of the Holy Spirit. And immediately Jesus appears on the scene and is baptized and pronounced the beloved child of God. And then is thrust out into the wilderness to battle evil. The next thing we're told is that John is in prison and Jesus is proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Stories are important. They shape our identity. When I was in grade six, my teacher discovered that I was reading below, a, um, spelling below a grade three level. So I was given homework and extra support in class and encouragement from my parents and within a few months light bulbs went on and I seemed to learn how to spell. Now, I still wouldn't say I'm a great speller but I have the tools and have overcome this problem. Similarly when I was a little girl my parents called me Marble Mouth because I scrambled up my words and I mispronounced and even mislaid some of them. And so I took lessons on public speaking in school and in Toastmasters and finally in seminary. And now I would say, well, in truth, I would say that if you've been to a late evening meeting, I still lose some of my words. But I would say I have overcome the problem because it doesn't hold me back from preaching. When I was first in seminary, the very first week, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, but I have overcome that. I no longer identify as a lousy speller or as a marble mouth or as one who suffers from breast cancer. With God's help, I have overcome these things. It's part of my story. In fact, if someone now tells me there's something that I cannot do, it just makes me want to try harder. 
So what makes the story of Mark's gospel special? Mark is known as the essential gospel because it was the earliest circulating narrative of the life of Jesus. Now certainly, shared among those early Christian communities, there were other documents, but they weren't as complete and they haven't lasted, they've been lost. Mark is the first complete, the earliest complete narrative to come down to us. Scholars think that Mark was the nephew of Barnabas who traveled with Mary. And they also say that he could be the son of Mary who opened her house to worshipers. It was the first little church in Jerusalem and she opened her house to Peter. Mark is mentioned several times in Acts. In fact, all these snippets give us a profile, kind of, we can watch Mark grow up in the book of Acts. You know, he starts off boldly on the first journey, but then he's declared a quitter and he leaves that. And later he tries again. By the time Paul's letters are written, we see that he is an effective um, minister of the world, word. But it's Peter. Peter thinks of Mark as his son. I don't think he was his birth son, but he, in 1 Peter 5, 13, he, he says, Mark, my son. It is believed that he traveled extensively with Peter, and he wrote down all of Peter's sermons, and he organized this collection into the story of Jesus' life. So Mark was not an eyewitness to Jesus, but he used all that he learned from Peter to draw us into the story of Jesus and the kingdom of God. Of all the Gospels, Mark gives us the best picture of Jesus' humanity. He connects us to Jesus the carpenter. And even after he is recognized as the Messiah, still paints pictures where he sighs deeply, is moved by compassion, marvels at the disciples' lack of understanding, acts with righteous anger, and feels love for everyone, from a rich young ruler to the little children that are always trying to be near him. Mark also clearly proclaims Jesus' divinity. From the very first line, he said, this is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Again, he tells us of all the impact that Jesus made on the hearts and minds of those who heard him. To Mark, Jesus is not simply a man among men. Jesus is a God among men. Mark's gospel began to circulate through the Christian communities after Peter's death, when Peter could no longer preach and teach and share the meaning of Jesus' life and his lessons and his death and his resurrection. Then Mark wrote it all down so that the story would continue on. My study Bible indicates that the Gospel of Mark was written between 65 and 75 CE, after Peter's death, and after Rome burned and the persecutions began. When suffering and oppression were the realities of the Christian communities, then Mark's Gospel offered them the good news of Jesus Christ. It promised them that the kingdom of God had already broken into the world and God's economy was not based on coercion and conquest and enslavement. Now, the good news of Caesar ended civil wars and made the rich richer, so there was some sort of peace and prosperity for some people, but it was brought on by force and conquest and coercion. The good news that Jesus proclaimed was for fishermen 
and shepherds and tax collectors and all sorts of hard-working folk, many of whom were suffering. It offered healing and release and a bond with God. It promised that God would eventually overcome all evil and create a new existence. And in the meantime, Jesus offered an example of how to live faithfully through it all. The Gospel of Mark was written to draw people into the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection so that they could respond and believe in the kingdom of God and live with faith knowing that they were living in God's love. Nearly 20 centuries after Mark wrote this gospel, here we are reading and unwrapping his text together. Many of us already consider ourselves followers of Christ. And so what brings us into this gospel today? Now, some are new to the faith, and they are ready to read through the gospel of Mark beginning to end and soak up every image, every saying, every teaching in there, just soak it all up like a sponge. Others of us have read it before. We've been on our journey of faith for a while. Maybe we're looking for those familiar passages to not only give us comfort, but inspiration. New Testament scholar Mitzi Minor suggests that all of us take the episodes of our lives and we weave the people and the places and the events together to tell stories. Some of those stories are just simply fun. They're told to entertain. Others are moral tales shared so that family and friends do not make the same mistakes. And still others are retold for generations because they touch a deep spiritual place inside of us. They are composed of inspiring layers of underlying truth that invite but don't force themselves on us. And these stories, they help us understand our own stories. They remind us of who we are and from whence we've come. They help us remember what it means to be human as God created us to be. Mark's gospel is just such a story for us, if we allow it to be. In this season of Epiphany, will you take time to discover the light of Scripture? Will you let it lead you out of your personal darkness or your community's darkness? Will you take time to read the Gospel of Mark again from beginning to end? Putting aside everything that you think is in there, putting aside what you think you know, not trying to harmonize it or match it to the other Gospels. I ask you to just let us open ourselves to the inspiration and the insights and the possibilities of living for faithfulness. Finally, let us read Mark again, not for the historical or theological information, but let us read it so that it transforms our hearts and our minds and the way we live, because that's why Mark wrote it in the first place. Amen.
gospel call wonderful words of life all for pardon and peace to all wonderful words of life Jesus only Savior sanctify forever beautiful words wonderful words wonderful words of life beautiful words
We've come to the point in our worship service today where we are going to stop and take time to pray for one another. We believe in the power of prayer. Over the last week, we had several prayer requests come in to the church office on our online form and just emailed in that we want to make space to pray for today. So I'm going to take a moment and share with you, I'm gonna read some of those prayer requests that are public that have been asked to be lifted up. When I'm done with that, I will close our time together in prayer today. These are the prayer requests that have been brought forward. Kathy Rents requests prayers for her brother, Gary, who's having surgery for pancreatic cancer. We pray for Sarah Carter, who is in isolation in her assisted living home. Um, it has been asked that if you know her to send a greeting card to lift her spirits. We pray for Charlie, who's losing his eyesight and his mobility is limited. And that prayer request is from Gwen. And we pray for Geraldine Kidwell that has an early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Prayers for her and her physicians as they determine a way forward. We also remain in prayer for those in our church family who are experiencing loss, loss of loved ones and loss of church friends and dear family members. Would you pray with me today? Father God, there are so many. There are so many of your children who are in pain, who are hurting. We ask that in these times of darkness and trial that we turn to you just as we're doing now in prayer, as we're lifting up those we care about. We ask that we remember on a daily basis to turn to you. May your healing hand and guiding touch be with everyone who is ill, everyone who's tested positive for COVID, everyone who is facing a new diagnosis and is uncertain of what's to come. We pray for their doctors, for their physicians, for their healthcare providers, that you would lead and guide them to answers, to treatments, to the ways in which to best care for the people in our community that we hold dear. God, we lift up to you all of the political unrest that we see in our community in our country, and in our world. This week, as we approach the inauguration, we pray for peace. We pray for your will to be done and for your protection to come upon your people. We pray for the leaders of our country. That they may follow you in all decision-making God, there's just so much. It is so hard sometimes to find the light, but we know and we hold on to the truth that you are the source of light and that from you, we too can share that light with others. Help us to share your peace this week. Help us to share your joy this week. Help us to be a light in the world, wherever we go no matter what we face. God, it is in your holy and precious name that we pray. Glory shine on us. Let the light